I lift my eyes to the hills where my help is coming. All right. Uh, somebody tell me what we've studied already about the subject of sanctification. First of all, what does the word sanctify mean? What does the word sanctify mean? Set apart. Set apart. The word sanctify means set apart. Specifically in the Bible, it's set apart for a holy use. For example, uh, God sanctified, the scripture tells us in Jude 1, God sanctified us, the people of God, sanct were sanctified before the foundation of the world. They were sanctified by God the Father. They were set apart for a holy use before the foundation of the world. We need to thank God for that sanctification that we were set apart by God before the foundation of the world. Sanctified by God the Father. Then we stated about we were sanctified by Jesus Christ at the cross of Calvary. The Word of God talks about how we're sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're set apart by the blood of Jesus Christ. The same people that were sanctified by God the Father before the foundation of the world, they were sanctified by the blood of Jesus Christ uh, at the cross of Calvary. And then a third sanctification that we looked at is that God sanctifies some individuals for a particular work for them to do during their lifetime. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, where God says that God sanctified, God said to Jeremiah, he said, before I formed thee uh, in the belly, I sanctified thee and ordained thee to be a prophet unto the nations. So what was... Was it possible, was it possible for Jeremiah to die during his childhood? No. It was impossible for him to die during his childhood. Why? Because God had set, a, set him apart and God was going to keep a protective edge around him to keep him alive because he was going, God had ordained he would be sanctified. Uh, he was sanctified to be a prophet unto the nations. Okay? God sanctified the twelve apostles. They were set apart by God for a holy use, to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. And they went out, they preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. They were set, set aside for that holy use of preaching the gospel. I believe that God still sanctifies men to preach the word of God. I believe God sets them apart uh, for that particular work. Uh, Jesus, Jesus said to the twelve apostles, Ye have not chosen me, but I have what? Chosen you. I have chosen you and ordained you that ye would bring forth fruit to perfection. Everybody follow that? Now, how could God be sure that they were going to bring forth fruit to perfection? How could he be sure that they would do that? Okay, because he sanctified them. He set them apart for that word. But let's suppose God sanctified you, which I believe God sanctified you, probably before you were ever born, for a lot of different things. How does God work in the lives of people that he has sanctified them for a particular work? How does God work in their lives to be sure they carry out those works? Conviction. Conviction. Tell me what you mean by that. By not letting you stray too far or keeping you, keeping you in check. That's exactly right. God, everyone that God sanctifies for a particular work, God, as when they begin to get out of line, when they begin to go astray, God immediately brings his judgment. The Asaph in Psalm 73 said, I don't understand why other people can live ungodly and they're not chasing, but I'm chasing every morning. Asaph was one of those that was chosen by God and was sanctified by God. Therefore, when he began to go astray, God did exactly like Brother Kyle said. He convicted uh, Asaph. And sometimes when God would convict him and warn him, don't do that, he would still go ahead and do that. So then God would immediately bring severe judgment that would immediately get him back in line, which would 
keep him from destroying his ability uh, to do what God had ordained him to do. Everybody follow that? So God has uh, sanctified particular people for particular works. And probably most of you, God has sanctified for particular work to do. You follow that? I believe that there are individuals that God is going to show the truth to because he, know they'll, he knows they'll love the truth and he knows they'll defend the truth. Therefore, he drags them, sometimes unwillingly, but he will get them to do what he has called them to do. Here's the way God expresses it in one of the Psalms. He says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Everybody hear that? Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. When God brings his judgment, guess what we're willing to do? Whatever he says to do. And God told Jonah first, Rise and go to Nineveh. He rose and fled to Tarshish. After he went through hell, then God spoke to him a second time in Jonah 3. And God said, Arise and go to Nineveh. And he arose and went to Nineveh. You follow me? He was willing, the second time God called him, he was willing to go because of the power of God that was manifest in his life. Now, today we're going to start on sanctification that we're to do. What of God says, sanctify yourselves. Sanctify yourselves. That means set yourself apart for a holy use. Sanctify yourselves. Somebody tell me, what does that mean, sanctify yourself? Okay, but how do you do that? What do you mean? What does that mean? Set yourself apart. Certain things, certain lifestyles. Okay, you you hear all that he's just said. You avoid certain lifestyles. You avoid certain people. There are things that you cannot go toward. Uh, God says in Second Corinthians chapter six, fourteen through eighteen, He says, "Come out from among them and be separate," saith the Lord. What is that same thing? What's the one word that means come out from among them and be separate? What's that word? Sanctify yourself. Sanctification. Come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters. There are special blessings that God has for the children of God that sanctify themselves. There is also judgment from God when we do not sanctify ourselves. So there are blessings when we sanctify ourselves. There are judgments and cursings when we do not sanctify ourselves. Can you think of anybody in the Bible that sanctified themselves? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Everybody turn in your Bibles. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Look at verse 14. 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 14. you read that? 1 Chronicles chapter 15 and verse 14. So the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. You remember, everybody remember that they could not touch the ark of God? You remember there were staves that went through and they had to pick it up without touching the ark of the covenant. There were loops in the end of the ark, both ends, and there was two uh, rods that went through there. So there were four men, took four men to carry the Ark of the Covenant. And the scripture says here that the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the Ark of the Lord. It was a dangerous thing for them to be, get, be living an ungodly life and even to pick up the stave of carrying the Ark of the Lord. So before they could pick up the ark of the Lord, they had to cleanse themselves. They had to purify themselves. They had to live a godly life. They had to sanctify themselves. So they sanctified themselves in order to be able to bring up the ark, the, uh, the ark of the Lord. Somebody tell me any similarity you see in today's life that would compare to those priests that sanctified themselves to carry the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord. Okay, tell me how, how is that, you're correct. 
Before a person joins the church, they should sanctify themselves, cleanse themselves, bring forth fruit, meet for repentance, is specifically uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. We're to bring forth fruit, meet for repentance. Uh, that's sanctifying ourselves so that we can then, how is it that you, as a child of God, who has sanctified yourself, how is it then that you carry the ark of the Lord? What does the ark of the Lord represent in our lives today? What in our lives today represent the ark of the Lord? Say it again. Okay, the truth, the word of God. The word of God. So every time that we pick up the word of God, every time we carry the word of God, every time we speak the word of God, we're carrying the ark of the Lord. What was in the ark of the Lord? You remember one of the things, the main thing that was in the ark of the Lord, the ark of the covenant, what was one of the main things? The Ten Commandments. Ten, the Ten Commandments were in that Ark of the Covenant, which is the Word of God, the Commandments of God. That They were carrying the Word of God. And before they could carry the Word of God, they had to sanctify themselves. Likewise, in our lives, before we begin to handle the Word of God, Scripture says if we handle the Word of God deceitfully, there's a fiery judgment that comes in our lives. Handling the Word of God deceitfully. If these priests, and there were two individuals that they decided that carrying the Ark of the Covenant was too much trouble, so they just put it on a, uh, put it on a, a cart and uh, carried it on a cart, and then they were going down through a ditch, and the uh, wheels got stuck, and the Ark uh, began to, to slide off of the cart they had put it on. What did those two men do? Say it again. They grabbed it. That seemed like a good thing to do, to grab it. Seemed like a good thing to do because they didn't want it to fall down in the mud. But God had said, don't touch the ark. And anybody who touched the ark was going to be put to death. Those two men, when they grabbed it, they both died. You follow that? It's a serious thing to handle the word of God deceitfully. If I know God's word teaches something and I won't preach it because I'm afraid of your response, I'm handling the word of God deceitfully. If there are things in the word of God... I run away from and will not touch on, will not preach on, I'm handling the word of God deceitfully. God will withdraw his spirit from me and refuse to allow me. I can still get up every Sunday, but I can't preach in the spirit with, with, with God's blessings if I'm running and afraid and refuse to preach something in God's word because I'm afraid of the people. Everybody follow that? So the, the priests were to sanctify themselves before they could touch the ark of the Lord or carry the ark of the Lord. Same thing is true in all of our lives. Every child of God, when we begin to speak about the word of God, we better sanctify ourselves. Okay? So the Levites sanctified themselves. The scripture speaks of many others uh, that are mentioned here in the uh, study that I've handed out to you. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 very quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Okay, stop right there just a minute. Well, go ahead and finish that sentence, that verse. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Uh, effeminate are those that are... Uh, queer, they're homosexuals, they're, uh, they're acting, men, they're acting like girls. Everybody follow that? They're effeminate. There are a lot of different uh, ways you can describe them, but they're all uh, very ungodly. You follow me? Now, this says, no, you're not, unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So before you can inherit the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? Set yourself apart. Set yourself apart for all these. You have to stop if there's any of these things that you're doing. No, you're not. The, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators. What's a fornicator? That's just as ungodly as the uh, homosexuals. What's a fornicator? We don't look at it as being ungodly. It's just as un fornication leads to homosexuality. It's all sexual immorality. Homosexuality com comes under the umbrella of fornication. Though it is a specific sin of fornication. What is fornication? Sex. 
marriage. Yes, sex before marriage. Sex before marriage. Uh, or sex outside of marriage. Adultery comes under the umbrella of fornication. Adultery, homosexuality, and premarital sexual relations. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So before you can inherit the kingdom of God, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So before you can inherit the kingdom of God, what do you have to do? Say it again. You have to lay aside those things and set yourself apart from those things. You have to sanctify yourself. Okay? Now look at the next verse. And such were some of you, and such were some of you that ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, that ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay. So what does Paul say to the church at Corinth? Were there people that had been guilty of the things that he just described? Yes. Yes. And such were some of you, but you are now mm -hmm. sanctified. You follow me? They're set apart. Are they still living those lifestyles? Are they still living those lifestyles? No. The fifth chapter makes the plain if they're living those lifestyles, they have to be put out of the church. And then in chapter 6, he says, you can't inherit the kingdom of God by living ungodly. Why are you living ungodly? Therefore, you have to sanctify yourself in order to remain in the church, but also to remain or to be in the, what? Kingdom of God. Okay? Sanctify yourself. Somebody just make it very simple. Tell me what are we talking about today? What do we, what are some things we have to do to sanctify ourselves? Tell me anything you can think of. Tell me any way that you have to sanctify yourself. You have to set yourself apart from the world. Don't fall into the temptations of the world. Stop all those sins that we just listed. Just be separate. Okay, be separate from the world. Stop doing the things that you know are wrong. If you don't, then you're not sanctifying yourself and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Worse than that, you will be cast into a hell fire while you live here in this world. Okay? I, I remember early in my ministry, one of the biggest shocks I got out of my life, there was a, a, a man in the church in Columbus and he was the head of uh, the, the airport, uh, and, and, and uh, that was a big airport, wasn't a little bitty airport. Had a very high paying job, making a lot of money, and, uh, and I found out that he was committing adultery. I confronted him, he denied it, uh, and I told him, I said, you're going to suffer hell. And I told him, I said, you, you cannot be in the kingdom of God, because he had finally understood the kingdom of God. I said, you cannot be in the kingdom of God and do the things you're doing. You can't be part of you. Go, you go to these big conventions, you're drinking, and you're having sex uh, at these conventions, and I've got proof of it, and you're going to be brought before the church if you don't repent. He said, I may miss the kingdom of God, but I'm enjoying my life. The next thing I said was, because I hadn't really dwelt on this, you're going to hell. You're going to hell. Is there anything wrong with that statement? Can I unequivocally say you're going to hell? Uh, I'm trying to figure out. Hell. Oh, shock, shock. Which hell? I cannot say, and I have never said anybody is going to eternal hell because I don't know whether they're a child of God or not. I can unequivocally say. You're going to hell. If you're living an ungodly lifestyle, you're either, as a child of God, you're going to hell here on this earth. Does God put his people in hell when they walk contrary to God's word? Indeed he does. Uh, so I can say to an individual, and I have the responsibility to say that they're going to hell if they don't repent. So I say that it's not just that you're going to going to miss the kingdom of God because that was the crux of his argument was I'm willing to give up the kingdom of God to enjoy life 
You follow me? I'm going to enjoy life. And I'm, I may miss the kingdom of God, but I'm willing to give that up. What did he not understand? He didn't understand that he sanctify himself. Yes, he didn't understand that he had to sanctify himself, but he also didn't understand you're not just going to miss the kingdom of heaven. Just Say it again. He can enjoy it for a season. Okay, he can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hey, there's something else he didn't understand. Because he did enjoy those pleasures of sin for a season. And then he did something so wrong that he lost his job. He lost his family. He lost his home. He lost everything he had. I watched that man be a pauper. Lose everything. Everything. That's a horrible, horrible hell that he went through. And he knew he was in hell. Which made me know what? I knew he was a child of God because God judged him here. If an individual lives their entire life uh, in ungodliness and they don't suffer under the judgments of God, I cannot say for sure they are a child of God. Because whom the Lord loveth, he what? Chasteneth. He chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If a person is a child of God, they're going to suffer hell here on this earth uh, when they walk contrary to God's word. If they don't, blank themselves know what sanctify. sanctify if they don't sanctify themselves then they're going to suffer while they live here in this earth can I live a hell here on this earth absolutely can it be too late for me to repent can I reach a point in my life that it's too late for me to repent without me experiencing the hell here on this earth yes yes in fact the Bible teaches it's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. And that without God's help, I can't repent. Okay? What have we studied about sanctify yourselves? Somebody tell me a summary of that. Just tell me a summary of what have we been talking about, sanctify yourselves. So basically we need to turn away from all the sin that we're in, uh, repent for it, and start living a better life where we don't do those things. Yes. And here's the thing. The devil will make you think these are little sins and I'm not committing adultery or being a drunkard or this, that, and the other. But these, quote, little sins will lead to bigger sins in our lives, always. So the idea, well, I'm not that bad. I've had a lot of people tell me that. I, I may not be as good as so-and-so, but I'm not that bad. Well, that's the way the devil the devil deceives us. Okay? Uh, another aspect of sanctification. How many have we talked about so far? First of all, we talked about God did what? Sanctified us when? Before the foundation of the world. Yes, before the foundation of the world. Then we talked about Jesus sanctified us when? On the cross of Calvary. Third sanctification is that God has sanctified some people to a particular work while they live here on this earth. Fourth sanctification we've talked about is we are to sanctify ourselves. Those individuals that God has chosen for a particular work, God especially warns them, sanctify yourself. There's no telling what all Jeremiah went through from the time God told him you're going to be a prophet to the time he actually started prophesying, he might have experienced a lot of the chastening hand of God. Okay? So God sanctifies certain people for particular works. Then God tells us we're to sanctify ourselves. That's what we've been talking about primarily this morning. And now then, the Word of God says that we are to sanctify God in our hearts. What do you think that means? That we are to sanctify God in our heart. Sanctify God in our heart. What does that mean? Make Him first priority. Yes, yes. Make Him first priority. He's to be number one. We're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. He's number one. We love Him. How do I know whether or not I love him? How can I tell whether or not? How can you tell whether or not I love God? 
By your actions. By my actions. Uh, if we say that we love him and we keep not his commandments, we're a liar. And the truth is not in us. Okay? So you can tell whether or not I have sanctified myself, and you can tell if I have sanctified God in my heart by looking at the way that I'm living. That, that helps you know, have I sanctified God in my heart? All right, look at, uh, turn your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're talking about sanctifying God in our hearts. 1 Peter chapter 3. Somebody tell me, why do we have to look at all these different categories of sanctification? There are more arguments among Christians because of an ignorance of God's word than there is any other reason. Uh, if, you, if you start arguing about what do you have to do to go to heaven? We've got all these different denominations. That's the number one reason that we are divided in denominations. It's because we don't agree about what you have to do to go to heaven. Right? Well, what could straighten all that argument out? Understanding the word of God. Understanding there's more than one heaven. That would straighten all that out. Alright? Right now we're looking at sanctification. Some denominations just preach we're sanctified by God the Father. And they will fight you if, you if if you teach them or say or preach. If they hear you preach, you've got to sanctify yourselves. They're going to rise up in arms against you. Why? Why will they fight you when you say sanctify yourselves if they believe you're sanctified by God? Why will they fight you? Like I said, don't understand the difference it does teach that we can't sanctify ourselves. That's right. That's right. I don't sanctify myself eternally. Me sanctifying myself doesn't get me to eternal heaven. That sanctification was done by God the Father. But there is a sanctification. A lot of different sanctifications. Now then, we're looking at sanctifying the Lord God in our hearts. First Peter, first Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. First Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Okay. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Is that something we have to do or God does for us? Yes. Something we have to do. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Love God. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's putting God as first priority. God's more important than anything else. If I don't sanctify God in my heart, I'm going to go astray from God. I have to sanctify God in my heart before I will ever sanctify myself from the ways of the world. I can't turn away from the ways of the world if they're still number one in my heart. If I turn away from them today on Sunday, I'm going to go right back to them on Monday if I don't sanctify the Lord God in my heart. So I need to understand, in order to sanctify myself, my being, I have to begin by sanctifying God in my heart. Numbers chapter 20. Back up in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 20. Talking about sanctifying God in our hearts. In Numbers chapter 20. Look please at verse 12. Numbers 20. In verse 12. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because he believed me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore he shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given you. Okay. Is this sanctifying yourself, or is this sanctifying God in your heart? Look carefully at the wording. In your heart? Yes. Why do you say that? Because he believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Yeah. Everybody follow that? Sanctify me. Sanctify God. Now, why does that, if I were to say we've got to sanctify God, and I don't put in our heart. If I, if I were to say we've got to sanctify God, and you don't understand the teachings of the Bible, what do you think I'm going to say when I say we've got to sanctify God? What do you think I'm saying? Most ignorance, uh, the Word of God will say that we're 
as we as Brother Brooks had said I had the beginning of the study, we're trying to make it even spiritual. We're trying to set him apart. Okay, well, yeah, that's right. That's right. We're trying to sanctify God. We're going to try to make God holy. We're going to make God holy. We're going to make God righteous. Sanctify. And that's not at all what the Bible's talking about when the Bible talks about sanctifying God. That's the misunderstanding that people have when they fight against that we're to sanctify God in our hearts. But God's clearly saying in the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, sanctify me in your heart. Sanctify God. Sanctify the Lord. Everybody follow that? He's to be number one in my heart, my mind, and my soul. Sanctify me. Let, let all of us understand that we need to put God first in our lives. And that's sanctifying God in our hearts. Sanctify. God told these priests, sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Now, uh, how would the children of Israel see that the priests had sanctified God in their hearts? How would the children of Israel see that the priests had sanctified God in their hearts? Yes, by their words. When they saw a priest that was trying to do right, live right, they're all imperfect. None of them are absolutely perfect. But when those priests are trying to live right, they see that individual, those priests were sanctifying God in their hearts. Everybody follow that? And, and God told the priests that they were, sanctified, they were to sanctify the Lord God in the sight of all Israel so that Israel would see that's what a human being looks like it sanctifies God in his heart. Sanctify me. Okay? Now then, uh, I want to go to, to, to two other things about sanctification. Uh, we can sanctify others. Listen carefully to what I just said. We can sanctify others. First Corinthians chapter 7. Talking about us sanctifying others. First Corinthians chapter 7. Listen to verses 12, 13, and 14. Marvelous uh, statement of truth here that uh, is beautiful truth that that we all need to understand. First Corinthians chapter seven, read twelve through fourteen. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, she be pleased to dwell with him. Let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let him not let her not leave him. For the unbelieving Everybody listen carefully to verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now they are they holy. Okay. Now this says the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, or the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Somebody tell me, in what sense or how is it that an unbelieving wife can be sanctified by a believing husband or an unbelieving husband, the verse, the opposite. How can that be? How does that happen? I'm going to give you the answer. When I read that, I'm going to tell you what I think. Okay. When, when, when two people are unbelievers when they're married, and then one of them becomes a believer, when they get married, they believe the truth, and that's why it's telling them not to, don't depart if the other is pleased to dwell with them. Okay. Okay. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Now, if they don't depart, how is the unbeliever going to be sanctified by the believer? Somebody tell me. Sister Moni, give me an example. Or tell me how. Believe. I'm just thinking he, the man or woman, be doing the right thing, but he believed in God to, to not depart. Okay. Okay. And how is this, as good, let's go back to what Brother Walter said to begin with. You've got two unbelievers, and they marry, and then one becomes a believer. Uh, that believer, is there going to be a major difference in that believer's lifestyle? Yeah. Is there going to be a major difference in the way she treats her husband? Yeah. Is she going to see that difference? Is he, I'm sorry, he, is he going to see the difference in that woman's life? Him seeing her live godly and holy and righteous will have a sanctifying effect on him. I can give you numerous examples uh, in the Word of God as well as uh, in real life where 
either a woman, uh, sanctified her husband, a woman live godly, uh, and the husband was not, but because of the faithfulness of the woman, God converted the man, and he became sanctified. Everybody follow that. We can sanctify others. Uh, Job 1 verse 5 says that Job sanctified his children. Every day, every day, Job feared that his children might not be living right. And so the scripture says that Job made offerings and sacrifices every day for his children, lest they live ungodly and, and, uh, and God's judgments come on them. So they were, Scripture says, Job sanctified his children. Can you sanctify other people? Yes. Okay. The deacon. Now here's a, here's a, a difficult thing to follow, but follow in closing. Uh, deacons. Uh, what is the, uh, are deacons ordained of God or are, or are deacons ordained by the church? Yes. Deacons are ordained by the church. God calls preachers. That's God's work. And then God gives the church the command to choose seven men in the early church, Acts 6. Choose seven men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. Who did and, and set them apart, sanctify them, for the work of taking care of the widows. Do you follow me? Who sanctified those men who are deacons? The church body. The church body. Everybody follow that. We set them apart for a holy use. Brother David and, and uh, Brother Richard are sanctified by the church. Set apart by the church. Now, was there other, were there other sanctifications that took place in their lives before they were sanctified by the church, set apart by the church, were there other sanctifications, Brother Bryce and Jane? Any other sanctifications that you, you think would apply to those individuals before they were ever sanctified by the church? They had to sanctify themselves from the world. Yes, they had to sanctify themselves from the world. By definition of who those men had to be, they had to sanctify themselves first, not in order to be a deacon, but in order to be a Christian. Okay? I mean, the other sanctification that had to have happened first. God sanctified them. God sanctified them. When? On the cross. Okay? Tell me another time God sanctified them. The the Alright? Any other sanctification you can think of? That's good enough. That's three. That's three sanctifications that took place before the church ever sanctified them, set them apart. Can you sanctify other people? Yes, you can. The, the last part of this lesson says that we can sanctify, uh, God sanctifies some places and then there are things that can be sanctified. Your home needs to be sanctified. Everybody hear what I just said? Your home needs to be sanctified. You need to sanctify your home. Okay? There ought to be certain things that are not allowed in your home. There's, it's a sanctified home. Okay? I hope you learned something. All right, thank you all for being here. God bless you.